issues. Today I want to talk about entities, things that are behind the veil that you can't fully see until they show their hand necessarily and they're manipulating things in your life without you realizing it. Um, I've run into these beings all the time. I don't know who they are. Matrix agents, um, players who come in and out of this reality to mess with your life in order to do things. Uh, maybe you're going off track or they want to steer you in a certain way. So here they are pulling the levers behind reality. And ever so often you can catch them and you can see them for uh, what they are. These dark black entities that some people call shadow people, demons, entities, whatever. But my entire life, they have been behind the scenes making sure certain things happen or don't happen. And there is many instances throughout my life where I have caught them, I have seen them, I have felt them, and they don't like that. They will try to scare you, try to manipulate you into backing down and just taking what they have to serve you. And I've realized that the more that you stand in your own power without being shaken, I mean, they will project onto you fear and anxiety and weakness, vulnerability. But you have to realize that's not coming from you. That's their own weapons of manipulation that they want you to think it's coming from you so that you identify with that. And so then they can take advantage of you because they want you to think that you're powerless. You're less powerful than they are. So they can just come in and fuck with you and mess your life up and there's nothing you can do about it. And these are the, the tactics of manipulation these demons do to you. I, I've had many instances that um, I guess I can talk about. One instance is when just recently I will feel these things come in at night and they will try to interfere with my sleep and my dreams. It's almost as if they come in at, they come in at night while you're in your most vulnerable state because they force you to have to sleep. You have no, no way around that. If you don't sleep, you suffer tremendously. And there may be a reason for that. There may be a handicap that's set on our uh, meat suits and our consciousness because the longer you don't sleep, you're, you, you see past the veil of this reality and you'll realize the longer you don't sleep, the more agitated and paranoid and um, tired, but at the same time, you, you're able to see and think different things and see more, more of the energetic realm of this reality behind the, the veil. So they don't want that. And if you do start doing that, they're going to pump you with all of these negative side effects to keep you at bay. It's like almost tranquilizing a wild tiger. They, they're, they keep shooting these shots into you, hoping you that hoping that it will eventually put you down, put, put you to sleep so they can have their way with you. So they force you into this sleeping thing while at the same time, they make it hard for you to go to sleep. And it's like this constant tug of war. And you, you'll feel the presence of these things surrounding you. You may even feel them on your chest, um, messing with your mind, messing with your emotions, giving you anxiety attacks throughout the night for no, for no reason at all. 
other than just to just to bring you down into a lower state of of consciousness to keep you in that lower realm that's where they like to keep you and as soon as you start progressing to a higher frequency for lack of a better term here they come the the agents come in to put you back to where you belong to where they can feed and manipulate you the most but also there is a fake state of higher consciousness that they're totally happy with you being in like this fake blissful state of um, the world is working out for me I just 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 the fake spirituality part where you spiritually bypass the evils of this world and go straight to, oh, everything's great if I'm great. If I feel okay, then everything's okay. And there's a, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, and as I'm saying this, uh, there's... Matrix control agents, who they call police officers. Um, they're showing their hand right now and telling me they're listening because everything is being recorded. Everything is being watched Everything you do in your life is being tracked and traced. And that's something that uh, when people go through psychosis, when they break the veil of this reality, and then they get pumped with paranoia, fear, all these negative emotions, it's like a drug. It's like, okay, you just broke through the veil of reality. Now we're going to shoot you with all of these fears and paranoia and put you in this crazy state. Even though you, you realize and you can process things differently and you realize that you're in a prison now and that this world is evil and that most people will say that they're being watched and followed and their house is bugged um, they're in some kind of hell, hellish world where there's demons everywhere and uh, people are out to get them that's all true and they've broken through reality and now there's certain ways to get you back into the, the swing of mundanality and back in place. And it's to make you look crazy. And when you're, when you're going through these things, that's why it's good to have control over your body and your and your uh, feelings and emotions and realize that you are being shot with drugs basically from the spiritual realm it's like a poison dart shooting sh- shot into your your uh, aura from a non-physical location that is making you go through these heightened states of negative uh, experiences so that you don't keep progressing past the veil into deeper understanding because you'll soon realize that there are entities all around you and you are in some kind of prison it's more like a concentration there we go it's more of a concentration camp a concentration re-education camp where we don't even know that we're in it and that is the key to their manipulation. We don't even know that we're in this concentration re-education camp, and that way we're more easily uh, manipulated, and uh, we bite back. (laughs) It was a sign I just passed, uh, telling me that I don't want to keep going down this route, but I, I will, and I'll continue to. Um, And a lot of these things are hard to talk about because since we're in this maximum security concentration um, re-education camp, there's shackles on everything that makes us us. There are uh, all sorts of things that 
keep you from the freedom of who you really are. Like words in general. So, and it's hard to talk about these things. So what helps me talk about these things is if I just start talking and it sounds like you're crazy and they pump those thoughts into your mind. Uh, because there is the brain is like a device that gives them control over how you think and feel and they can stop and hinder you from doing or thinking things you just have to realize what's being done and try to circumvent that and realize that you can get past these blocks if you keep pushing if you keep pushing because the blocks are not you. They are little minefields and traps that they set inside of you that go off. It's like when keywords get triggered on the internet, they can block, they can come in, they can censor, whatever. And it's the same thing with your mind. Certain keywords get triggered, certain thoughts are keywords that get triggered they know that you're thinking things that they don't want you to think. You're, you're realizing things that you're not supposed to be realizing. You're experiencing yourself again that is not coming from them. And they get alerted. Then they have ways of bringing you back to back in line without you even realizing that's what happened to you. All along, you're thinking it's you. You're thinking that that's just the way that I am. That's just the way that my mind works. I don't know why I learned something. And then an hour later, I totally forgot what I was thinking or what I was going through. I have to relearn it over and over. Oh, why is it so hard for me to think? Why is it so hard for me to talk about these things? How come when I get around a group of people, I'm not able to express these certain truths in ways that they can understand. It's because they've shackled our they've shackled us and retarded us in such ways that we are not able to do that. And then the people that we're talking to, they are stunted and retarded in ways that they can't even receive it. Our natural ability of telepathic communication, where I'm going to communicate exactly what I mean in a way that it cannot be misinterpreted or misunderstood. If this is 100% truth of what I want to communicate with you, and you cannot receive it any other way other than the way I'm communicating this with you. That is true 100% free will communication without any deceptions or traps put in the way to stop two people from openly and honestly and effectively conveying truths to one another. And you see that kind of thing does not happen here and it cannot happen here because of the limitations that have been put onto us and even as I'm saying this I'm sure that it's not coming across in ways that I want to fully express that's how it's done here so so I'm going to try my best to describe some of these instances where these entities have invaded my life one time I was getting ready for bed and the whole time I was getting ready for bed, I felt something in the room with me this that I could not shake. I felt like I was being watched and observed. And I did my best to just ignore it. I was getting ready for bed. And I get in bed. The usual going to sleep process. Next thing I know... I'm being shaken violently awake. And I say violently because it's very 
abrupt and forceful. And it catches me off guard, obviously. And I look up and my whole surrounding is pitch black. There's no lights on. But I can see this entity. It was darker than the darkness around it. And I could see a perfect outline of this human-like black figure shaking me. And in my stupor, I say something like, I'm trying to sleep. I don't know why you're shaking me. If you want in the bed, just get in the bed. You don't have to wake me up. (laughs) I don't know why I said that, but that's what I said. And all of a sudden, I'm let go. This thing slowly rolls over top of me and lays right next to me in bed. It's so close to me that I can feel it breathing beside me. And before I know it, I'm back into the void of unconsciousness. And then I wake up. And it all comes back to me. And I'm sitting there thinking like, wait a second. That actually just happened to me. And now there's no one here. I'll tell you one more story about an entity encounter that happened when I was in Peru. I was in the Amazon rainforest doing um, shamanic ceremonies for about a month. And one night... After I had gone back to bed, I went to my tambo, which is a little hut in the middle of the jungle, all to yourself. I felt extremely sick and hot, feverish that night. And as I was laying in my hammock, I felt like I might just end up dying that night for some reason. So I decided to crawl into my bed And when I was in my bed, I tried to sleep. And eventually, I ended up having very lucid dreams the whole night. And at one point, I was talking to some entity. I don't know what it was. It was like I was under a trance and I was, we were communicating back and forth. And as soon as I broke the trance and and became conscious in my body, and realizing that I had been talking to something and something was talking back to me, I open my eyes and look, and there is this dark, creepy, slithery feeling, black demonic entity with hair like snakes, almost like Medusa, like moving around. And as soon as it noticed me, notice it. It knew that I was conscious. It was it was on top of me. It was straddling me, basically, on top of me. And as soon as I it knew I was conscious, it began moving and slithering. Um, it had a human-like body, of course, but the way it moved, it was very slithery-like. And it began tickling me very roughly, almost like pervertedly. And in a way that was very uncomfortable and hurt. And I tried to shake this thing off of me, but it it wouldn't get off and it just kept getting closer and closer to my face as it's tickling me very roughly and pervertedly. And eventually I I shake it off and it's it's gone. And I think I'm safe for a moment and I'm just processing what happened. And then all of a sudden, this extremely loud, animalistic, machine-like screech came from beneath my hut. And it started out very quiet and got louder and louder and louder and louder until it felt like the sound itself was engulfing my entire body and like I was being sucked into it. It almost felt like I was on the verge of possession if that is a thing i've i've never experienced that but it felt like i was being sucked into this animalistic machine like sound and i fought and fought and fought to get out 
Um, and the fear just engulfed me because I didn't know what was happening. And this went on for a while and I tried to yell and nothing would come out. And um, I saw my head, my headlamp laying next to me and I reached for it and I started to, to try to turn it on. <laughs> but of course, it wouldn't come on. And then all of a sudden, it all just went away. It was just me there alone with nothing. And it almost felt like it wanted to gaslight me into thinking, oh, you just made all that up in your head. But that experience was so real that I know it was a real experience. So, so this thing, what I can gather from this, when I was sleeping, it was, I was basically in a trance. And this thing was putting things into my subconscious mind, into my mind, and telling me things. And I was actually talking back to it, but I don't know what I was saying or what it was saying to me, but I know some kind of deception and manipulation was going on, and it was manipulating me somehow and putting thoughts into my mind while I was in a hypnotic trance. So... That is a very interesting thing. And then when it found out that I became conscious and I could see what was going on, it got really pissed off and tried to instill fear inside of me to basically show me that I had no power and it could do whatever it wanted to me and I had no choice. Of course, I think that's all a lie, obviously, but at the time, it's what it felt like. Um, and if anyone knows anything about this or what's going on, what happened with this, I think these are some insights behind the veil about how these things can maybe attach and how it puts things in our subconscious mind and how it operates potentially. Another time when I was experiencing religious delusions, that's what the psychiatric field would call it. I would go to sleep and I was going through a lot, I was processing a lot of things and releasing a lot of things and going through many dark nights of the soul throughout my life. But this is a period of that time. And I would go to sleep and I would have sleep paralysis all the time. And one time, I was being choked by these entities in the middle of the night in my sleep. And I had woken up. And maybe that wasn't part of the plan, but I had woken up and could feel myself being choked. And something was on top of me. And I fought it off. Another time... When I was living with my mom, she said that she had heard somebody walking down the hallway and went into my room during the day. She had called for my name and no one answered. And she knocked on the door, no one answered, and then she opened the door. And of course, no one was there. And she called me and told me what happened. And she said, did you, did you come by and leave suddenly and without me realizing it? Because I thought I heard you come in, walk down the hallway, open your door and close it. I never heard you come out, but I opened the door because you weren't answering and no one was there. And I had been at work all day. I had not been there since I left this morning. And this was way past that. So that night, it's like something had walked in there and was waiting on me. So that night, I'd gone to sleep again. And that's when it struck. I had like the worst nightmares. And again, something was on top of me. Trying to frighten me and cause me harm. And 
if I had been in a fearful state and if I had been in a state of panic and paranoia, anxiousness, all of those things, I mean, I could have succumbed to whatever it wanted me to do. I don't know what it was trying to do. Scare me. But yeah, at, at first it's scary. I mean, that's your first reaction is fear because you're not only being shot with fear and negative energy through these beings, but your own fight, fight or flight starts kicking off inside your body and your survival mechanisms kick in. And of course you're going to be afraid because you're afraid of, you're fearful of things you don't know and you're fearful of suffering and you don't know if what's going to happen. Uh, your body doesn't want to die. So all these things are going on at once. But when you get past that and you stand in your, your own power and you defend yourself against these creeps, they back away. And that's exactly what I did. And they backed away. Um, but it was like a, a trap just set waiting for me. And that's what these, these things do. They, they wait until you're at your most vulnerable when you're asleep, <laughs> when you're not even in this world and you're somewhere else. And that's when they decide to attack you. Or they give you sleep paralysis, and that's when they decide to attack you. They can't face you head-on, one-on-one. They can't just appear in front of you when you're fully conscious. And I wouldn't say that we're fully conscious in this realm, but you know what I mean. Why don't they just appear when you have most of your faculties, in this meat suit at least, present? They won't do that because they're fearful. They're afraid of you, but they want you to think that you should be afraid of them. And I've, I've never been afraid of these things my entire life. Because you have to work past the, the initial fear that you get is more like a um, artificial feeling that's placed upon you so that you can agree with it, latch onto it, and be, take it in. And then you, you be that. Uh, but I've, always said that I'm more afraid of people than these, these things. And I've been a a ghost, quote unquote, ghost hunter for as long as I can remember. Um, You know, I've, I've progressed throughout the years and I've changed my thinking about these things. But yeah, I've, I've always wanted to explore and know the unknown. And there was nothing that I wouldn't, well, I'd say there's nothing I wouldn't do to do that, but, you know, morally, yes, I mean, I'm not going to do bad, evil things to hurt people. But the things that they say, oh, you're not supposed to do that, that's, that's too scary, or you, you don't want that kind of energy in your life. Uh, it, it's like when, when things get scary or uncomfortable, people are afraid to go further. But I've always been the one where, no, this is the point of exploration, is to explore the the mystery and to go past the uh, boundaries that they don't want you to go past i never i've never understood that about people who explore the unknown in the spiritual realm is oh we can't go past this point because it's too evil and scary we don't want the negative influence in our life But once you realize that you're in hell and everything that has been done to you is evil and scary and meant to put you in a lower state of consciousness and being to keep you in line. And this ain't, this ain't a good place. This has always been a bad place. So um, you're always surrounded by evil everywhere you go. So once you realize that, these little fear tactics, they stop working on you. So I can make these stories really long and drawn out and give you every single detail, but you don't really need to know that. You need to know the uh, the point of the story. So I used to live in an old farmhouse about almost 10 years ago now. And me and some friends were making a homestead out there and growing things. And it was on an old plantation-ish area. And there was an old shed out in the backyard. And my grandpa was a psychic self-proclaimed psychic and he did have some powers and I would like to think those things that were passed down to me um but when my f- 
friends and I, we had our families over and they were out in that, we were out in that shed. My grandpa started talking about this little slave girl who, he was picking up a presence of this little slave girl. He was telling us about the whole story about how um, she lived out here and she was killed because she had the, uh, the owner's baby and blah, 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 blah. This could all be just made up stories that entities are telling us because all history is fake in my opinion and what i've come to realize and it's all created by some kind of ai to make us believe in this world and its events and things like that but regardless these entities are tricksters so whatever they are they can trick you into believing whatever you want and they can take on any identity just so they can deceive you so i got a ouija board for halloween and me and my friends were using it, and we were getting lots of contact, lots and lots of contact. It was very active, and no one is messing around. This is very serious stuff. We don't play games with this. This, is, this was like a very serious thing that we were doing, serious investigations, and we don't mess around. We don't play games or tricks or anything like that. So with all that said, we decided to go out in the shed one day. And we were out there investigating and the Ouija board started talking to us and it started doing all of these very demonic stuff. Um, it got, it's really evil out there actually. We were like, whoa, it's saying all kinds of stuff like kill, 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 murder, um, like 666, trying to scare us off and saying all kinds of horrible things. But we just kept going and then all of a sudden it switched and the energy got lighter. And the more we were communicating with this new spirit, it told us that it was a little slave girl who used to live here that kind of, you know, grew up a little older, um, but not too much older. And she lived out here and she got murdered by the person who owned the property because she got pregnant and he ended up killing her and she got burned and buried underneath a tree right outside of the shed and the tree we always thought was this haunted really kind of evil feeling tree it was a perfect halloween tree it was dead all the time always dead <laughs> it was dead uh, i can't really describe it but it was the perfect ominous evil halloween tree and but she was buried right underneath it and she wanted for us to free her. She said that she was trapped here and she needed to be freed and she wanted us to dig her up. Now, this was a long Ouija board session, okay? I'm just giving you the, the, the fast forward version of it. Her name was NNZ. Those are the initials. She wanted us to dig her up outside. Normally people would be like, oh, hell no, we ain't touching that. We're done. We're done here. Um, but, you know, I am an actual ghost hunter back then. I'm an actual explorer of the mysterious realms of spirituality. That didn't scare me at all. That excited me. I was like, we all looked at each other and we were all excited. We're like, yeah, let's do it. And my mom, my mom was even like, I'll get a backhoe. I'll rent the backhoe. I'll pay for it. <laughs> it's like, we were all for it. So, um, the next couple of days, we, we dug. It was mostly me. I was the one who was most interested in it. I used a shovel. So I, I dug and I dug and I dug. It took me about two days because I wasn't going to spend all day digging. Eventually, I got to the point where I couldn't dig any deeper. Uh, I got to the point where, okay, I'm starting to not be able to reach anymore. This is getting extremely hard. And I remember I got a hand shovel... I put my hand way down in there and I started digging around and then I hit something and I found something and I brought it back up and it was charcoal, not like charcoal you get stored, but it was burnt remains of something. And as, as I picked it up, the suit got on my hands and then one of our dogs just ran by real fast and we saw this scratch mark. Its, its face 
with the soot, with this black soot that I had just picked up out of the grave, so to say, out of the, out of the earth. And our dog had the same soot mark, but in three claw marks right across his face. And we're like, what the, oh my gosh. Like, this is impossible that someone could have just put those scratch marks there as a joke or a prank or something. When I had just pulled this thing out of the grave, it was like back to back. It was like a chain reaction. And then we noticed the shed from the shed door. I looked into the shed door and on the wall, it said H I in the same charcoal soot that I had just picked up out of the ground. It was like I had, we had just released something from, from the portals of hell. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but it was written in little girl handwriting too. At, you know, and that this was all like kind of freaky and a little scary, but it was really exciting because, wow, we're, we, we are experiencing things that are beyond this mundane reality. And it's like, this, this is exciting. This is great. What what else is going to happen? Um, and you, I, I went over to the wall. And I, I inspected it. And it was the same charcoal that I found. And the same charcoal that was scratched with the dog. And we kept digging. And it was like a whole... It was all kinds of burnt stuff under this tree. So either this little girl was telling the truth. Or the Matrix just decided to download this to make this story very interesting who knows how reality actually works, but it was there in the physical reality. And something was happening in the non-physical reality, influencing our physical reality. So I'm still trying to figure out how it works. So this was all very exciting that I um, started collecting the charcoal, <laughs> but I couldn't reach it all. It was so deep down in there. The next day I was there alone and I was sitting in the the sunroom and all of a sudden I heard this little whimper from outside the window that sounded like a little girl it was like like a little girl was whimpering outside the window and I know most people would find this frightening and terrifying but I was fascinated by it um, and perhaps that's how you get possessed by things like this. I don't know, but <laughs> I was all about it. I mean, I still am. I, I find this stuff really fascinating to to know. I mean, I know there are things beyond this veil that are influencing this reality. And to actually have physical evidence through my senses and through what's going on, that this stuff is real. I have, um, you know, learned as I've matured through life and experiences and wisdom and from knowing, from learning truths about this reality, my, you know, my, my ways of thinking and my opinions on these things have changed dramatically over the years. So later on, we decided, okay, we, we need to, uh, there's something going on here. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need, uh, we need some more communication because this little, this little girl wanted, needed us to help free her from, When we're talking on the Ouija board, we're also getting these images that being sent. So she said that she was trapped here by these demonic spirits and she could not leave because she was afraid and they were scaring her and she wanted to, to leave, but she has been trapped here and she needed our help to, you know, uncover her, her grave basically, and to rebury her somewhere else and to help her spiritually leave so that was our intention and perhaps if they were influencing us our good hearted nature to actually do do help them come into physical reality then that's what happened because later on that night we went out to the this other shed that was even older and creepier in the middle of a field and there was nothing around so we were all out there using the Ouija board and trying to communicate. This time, usually the Ouija board was very active, almost, not immediately, but within like two minutes, it would be very active and it would remain active. But this time, 
in this old, really old barn-like shed in the middle of the field. It, um, fall, you know, it was falling apart in some places. We started to try to communicate, and it was just absolutely dead. Nothing was happening. The energy there was completely still, dead, nothing. And we were there for probably about five minutes with nothing happening. We're looking around and we're trying to remain focused. And all of a sudden, a very cold wind came through the window. And to me, it felt almost like a snake uh, slithering. That's how the wind, wind felt. It was so precise. It wasn't spread out. It was like directed like a line. And it just like weaved in and out of everyone there. And we all felt it. And we got goosebumps. And then all of a sudden we heard these giant heavy footsteps walking outside of the barn that we were in. It was like boom, 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 boom. And it would stop. And then all of a sudden from the other side of the shed... It would pick back up, boom, 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 and stop. And it would go from one side to the other side, back to the other side. And we're in the middle of a field. There's no one around us. There's nothing outside. It's night outside. It's dark. And we are hearing something physically walking. with. It's like heavy boots even. It was a very human-like walk that would go from one side to the other, back to the other. And it's physically impossible to do that. There had to be two people outside if they were playing a prank on us. But there was no one out there. We were the only people there. And then we started to get really freaked out. And when we started, when the fear started to build up inside of the the, uh, shed, the barn, um, there started to be tapping that went all the way around the shed, all the way around. And it would like a spiral up and 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 up until it got to the roof. And it was tapping on the roof. It was, let's just say like finger tapping all the way around, but in a loud echoey sound all the way around up to the roof. And it was tapping on the roof. And at that point, everyone like looked at each other with tears in our eyes. And that's when my sister said, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And I was like, no, no, you can't. You can't leave because this is what happens in scary movies. <laughs> the first person who runs out gets killed. <laughs> she was like, I don't give a shit. I'm out of here. And then she got up and bolted. And that's everyone got up and bolted. And then I got up and bolted. And we all ran. And they were like, we're never playing this Ouija board again. That, it was it was intense. Like it was very intense. The way I'm I'm describing this, you just had to be there to experience it because there's no way I can describe what was experienced that night and through it all. So that's a time when the veil between the worlds was very thin and something was coming through. Another time we played the Ouija board, this was probably about four years before the last incident, we got cardboard from a 30 pack of beer and we drew the Ouija board onto it and we started playing. We started using it. It was me, um, a couple of my guy friends, and then two of my girlfriends. And when we were using the Ouija board, one of the girls that was using it with us, she her hand got somehow cut during the process of this whole thing, and it had dripped blood onto this cardboard Ouija board that we made. And we were like, oh, you, you just dropped blood on it. It's It's going to be even more active and demonic now. Well, it started... We started to pick up this demonic presence of this entity called Seth and it was relating to one of our friends who was using it with us and he got really freaked out he said that this thing had been following him his entire life and he's done he doesn't want to play this anymore 
So he like picked it up and ripped it in two pieces and threw it out into the, the garbage can outside. Now I saw him do this. The next day I got home from work and I was throwing some trash away into the same garbage can. And I noticed that this Ouija board was sitting on top of the trash in one piece. It was in one piece. Now, the previous day, I had seen my friend rip it into two pieces and then throw it into this trash can. But now, it is in one piece. And it's the same one because the blood stain is still on it. And it was in the perfect handwriting and drawings that we had made previously. And I brought it inside and I said, hey, I didn't you rip this in two pieces? He was like... Yes, and I threw it away in that trash can. And now it's in one piece. So he like freaked out. I can't remember what he did with the Ouija board, but it was... Physical reality was able to be molded to put this thing back together. I have many, many, many more stories about things like this. But this video is getting very long. So for now, I'll leave it here. Let me know if anyone has any opinions, your thoughts, your ideas, and share your own experiences. And uh, maybe we could figure out what's going on with these things.